Hello and welcome to the chapter number one of our Mechanics of Materials 2. This will be the chapter seven from our book, Mechanics of Materials by R.C. Hibbler. As far as the chapter is concerned, the chapter is about the transfer shear in beams. First of all, let's understand what do we mean by transfer shear. Then, after understanding the concept of transfer shear, we will be using the we will be deriving the quantization formulas uh, for calculating the transfer shear in beams having any sort of uh, load distribution over them. So, as far as the transfer shear is concerned, we know that the beams are subjected to uh, different, uh, you know, any sort of loading. A beam may be a cantilever beam or it may be a simply supported beam. So whatever be the type of the beam we have, a beam on account of the load, it is on account of the load it is subjected to. It has what we call as at any of its cross section, we have internal uh, react reactive forces or what are actually known as the internal reactions. And we know in a beam, as far as the internal reactions at any cross section are concerned, the internal reactions at any cross section are in the form of the shear force, what we write by V, and we have bending moment M. Okay. In, in fact, this shear force and the bending moment at any cross section of the beam are called the internal reactions uh, in the beam. As far as this bending moment is concerned, from the previous video, we know that bending moment is responsible for creating what is called the normal stress in the beam, which is represented by stress is equal to minus my divided by r. The formula which we discussed in the previous uh, audio, in the previous video, we call this formula as the fluctual formula. So as far as this fluctual formula is concerned, this fluctual formula talks about the normal, normal stresses developed at any cross section, at any cross section of the beam. Now, as far as this uh, shear stress is concerned, this shear stress is a stress which is created at any cross section of the beam. And it is this shear stress which is created at any cross section of the beam and is the internal reactive uh, force, the shear force is the internal reactive force at any cross section of the beam, which is responsible for creating an equilibrium at any cross section of the beam. That is, if there is no shear uh, force between uh, at this cross section, uh, then definitely the left hand, the force exerted by the left hand portion of the beam will not be balanced by the force created by the right hand portion of the beam at this cross section. So for equilibrium, it's very, very important that this shear stress has to exist and it is actually existing at any cross section of the beam. Now, this shear stress is being represented here. The shear stress that is that is what we represent by V is the shear stress what is actually uh, known as the transverse shear stress. Okay, so transverse shear stress is this shear stress which exists at any cross section of the beam. Now, this transverse shear stress which is being represented by V, it's actually a resultant of the small, small shear stresses which exist at all the points of this cross section. Look at this cross section. So, at different points of this cross section, you have some values of the shear stress, what you, what is being represented by the symbol tau, okay? So this tau is the shear stress at any point of this cross section. In fact, this tau varies as you move along this axis or you move along this axis or you move along this axis or you move along this axis. So shear stress keeps on varying for different points on the cross section, the value of the shear stress is different. And this shear force is V, what we represented by V is equal to tau multiplied by A because shear stress is equal to shear force divided by A, area of, area of, the, area of the section. Therefore, the shear stress will be equal, the shear force will be equal to shear stress multiplied by the area. This, uh, this uh, tau is actually known as the average shear stress. This V is no, known as the average shear force. This tau is responsible for creating the shear stress on this beam, which is represented by V. And this V is known as the transverse shear stress. Now, if we are asked to calculate how much is the value of the transverse shear stress at any point of the beam, it means we should have a formula for calculating this V. What is the formula for calculating V? How we quantize this V, the shear stress, this V? How is the shear stress quantized at any cross section of the beam? I mean to say, how does the shear stress vary 
uh, across the different points of a given cross section. How is this way we vary? This is one important thing. That is, we should have the formula for the calculation of this V at any cross section of this B. Number one. After this, uh, this transverse shear shear stress, we have one more type of shear stress in the beams. That's what we call as the longitudinal shear stress. In order to understand the longitudinal shear stress, let's suppose we have a beam, and this beam is composed of, and this beam is, say, for example, composed of uh, three uh, pieces, okay, which are not bonded together. We have this beam, we have a beam, and this beam is composed of uh, three pieces, what we say, uh, three, uh, and which are not bonded together, okay? So as we are applying the load on this, uh, on the topmost uh, portion of this beam, uh we in fact have this beam made of three boards this is board one this is board two this is board three okay so on the topmost board let's apply the load p so on the application of the load p what happens that there will be relative motion what is the sliding motion between the uh, at, between these uh, corresponding boards that is there will be motion between board one and board two there will be motion between board two and board three and the motion will in fact be what you call as a sliding motion the board one will slide over board two the board two will slide over board three so this sliding is possible because we have not bonded these boards together now let's suppose we have one more beam but this beam is made of uh, but this beam is made of three boards again but these boards are now glued together so we have the glue between board one and board two and the glue between board two and board three. So these are these boards are now glued with each other. So as we are gluing these boards with each other, now they are fixed with each other. I again, apply the same load. Now, as we apply the same load, there won't be any relative motion. There won't be any sliding between board one and board two. There won't be any sliding between board two and board three because we have we are now preventing motion uh, by applying this glue between the corresponding boards. Okay. Now, uh, the motion has been stopped. So there is resistance to the motion, a relative motion between uh, board one and board two. So it means at the interface between this board and this board, at the interface, the surface uh, between the two boards uh, is uh, the surface which is being subjected to the forces, internal forces must have, must be created at the interface, which are actually, you know, preventing the effect created by the external load P. The effect of the external load P is to cause the motion, but the glue creates the internal forces to prevent that motion. So it means we will be having forces uh, at the interface, at the surface, at the, at the interface between board one and board two, at the interface between board two and board three. So at that very interface, there will be forces created, which will be in a direction opposing the effect of the motion, uh, opposing the effect of the force created by the load P. Load P is trying to create relative motion, but the internal forces acting in a direction parallel to the interface are preventing that motion. So it means that we'll be having shear force because this force will be acting in a direction parallel to the interface. So we'll be calling this is also our shear force. And you know, this type of shear force is called the uh, longitudinal shear force. And the stress, that is, uh, this longitudinal shear, shear force divided by the area or which this longitudinal shear force is acting is what we also call as this is the shear stress and the shear stress is called the longitudinal mm -hmm. shear stress. So it means as far as the as far as the beams are concerned in the beams we have two types of stresses shear stresses we have the transverse shear stresses uh, which act at a cross section and we have what we call as the longitudinal shear stresses which prevent the relative motion which are created on account of the uh, prevention of relative motion between the surfaces between the layers of which this uh, beam is made of okay so it is just i am repeating it again as far as uh, this uh, as far as this uh, uh, shear stresses in beams are concerned. We have two types of shear stresses in the beams. One type of shear stresses are called the transverse shear stresses, which act at, the, at any cross section of the beam, okay? And we have another type of shear stresses, what are called the longitudinal shear stresses, which are created on account of the prevention of sliding between the relative layers of a beam, 
Okay, so we have transfer shear stresses in the beam as well as we have the longitudinal shear stresses in the beam. Now look here, this uh, the, the textbook says, R.C. Ibler says, due to the complementary property of the shear, uh, the longitudinal shear stresses, uh, the, this, uh, the transfer shear stress creates the longitudinal shear stress, something uh, the complementary property of shear has been talked about. So first of all, we need to understand what the complementary property of the shear means, okay? Before we understand the complementary property of the shear, what's very important for us to understand is let's take a small element out here, okay? We have a cross section of the beam. At this cross section of the beam, let's suppose we have the shear stress tau, which is the transverse shear stress. Let's take a small area, let's take a small volume element out, okay, and let's do our analysis on the small volume element. As far as the small volume element is concerned, on this face of the small volume element, we'll be having tau as our uh, tra transverse shear stress, and on its top surface, that is this surface, we have the shear stress, what we call as a longitudinal shear stress. Since this volume element has been extracted out of this uh, big volume element, therefore its top surface, at its top, top surface, will be having the longitudinal shear stress. At its bottom surface, we again will be having the longitudinal shear stress. At its uh, this phase, we'll be having what we call as the transverse shear stress. And a phase opposite to this, will again be having transverse shear stress. Now let's do one thing. Let's take a wave from here, okay? If you start waving this element from here, this element as is being waved from here, this element will essentially be like this. We'll have, this element will be like this, okay? So on this element, we have, uh, let's draw these, uh, let's draw these forces that we have. Uh, let's draw these forces on this element. As you are now waving it from here, the different forces that are on different faces of the element will be now like this. So. Let's now draw these forces. One type of force will be, it will be, let's draw one force. It will be like this. So this is one force acting here. And on this direction, we have force like this. Sorry. Let me take this volume element again. So this is the element. And on this element, let's suppose in this direction, let, let's take this to be the direction. We have the elements are like this. We have stress, shear stress acting on this face and we have shear stress on this face, okay? The shear stress on this face is what you call as there. Uh, transverse shear stress. So this is our transverse shear stress. This is transverse shear stress. And this is longitudinal shear stress and longitudinal shear stress. Let's draw the arrows. Let's draw the arrows like this. Though we are free enough to change, we are free enough to draw the arrows in the downward direction. It, it's, it, it's not a botheration for us. Mm, the uh, significance of these arrows will be, uh, you know, explaining them at the end of this, uh, at the end of this lecture. So this is, let's draw these arrows like this. Let's say we have the transverse, we have longitudinal shear stress here like this. Let's draw it like this, okay? And let's suppose this is our point A, B, C, and D. Let's call this as point A. This we call as corner B. This we call as corner C. And let's call this as corner D, okay? Now this element will have some thickness. Let's say the thickness of this element is small t, okay? The thickness of this element, the thickness is say for example T as you have notified it, okay? Uh, let's for some time, let's call this to be our x-axis. Let's say this is our x-axis and let's treat this to be our y-axis, okay? So this is our x-axis, this is our y-axis, okay? So after drawing this, uh, this is the face. Look at this face, okay? This is this face, okay? This shear stress is acting on the face DC, okay? And it's acting on, in which direction? It's acting along Y direction. So we write this shear stress, we write by tau, we represent this shear stress by tau, and we call, the, we write this shear stress as tau, shear stress acting on a face perpendicular to X axis along 
y axis. We call this shear stress as tau xy. This is the shear stress acting on a face perpendicular to x axis along y axis. Okay, and we put a prime over it. Okay. In the same way, uh, let's write this shear stress as let's write this the shear stress on this. Let's call this as we'll be writing this as star shear stress acting on a face again perpendicular to x-axis along y-axis so this is acting along y since this face as you have to draw the normal outwards this face will be the minus x face and the shear stress is acting in the minus y direction so we'll not write this as tau prime xy we say this is tau uh, prime xy and we call this as tau xy now this shear stress on this face or let's talk about First, this shear stress is acting on a face perpendicular to x y axis along x axis. So we'll write this as this is shear stress tau acting on a face perpendicular to y axis, and this shear stress is acting x axis. We call this as tau prime, tau prime y axis. And as far as this shear stress is concerned, this one this is again acting on a face perpendicular to y axis along x axis. We'll be calling this tau y x. Okay. So this is these are our uh, shear stresses okay and since this direction is y let's say this thickness is this is this much distance is delta y this area element and let's say this distance is let's suppose delta x okay so this is our delta x and let's suppose this is our delta y and the thickness of this uh, cubical element is p okay so this is how our overall uh, elements behave um, now let's do one thing let's uh, sum up the forces uh, along uh, along x-axis and let's write since this element is in equilibrium it's not translating along x y or any other axis uh, we are not considering here the forces acting along z-axis what an analysis we will do here for forces acting along x and y axis only we will can draw an analogy for force acting along z-axis as well so writing the equilibrium equation sum up all the forces along x-axis and put them equal to zero for this will be the condition first condition of equilibrium because the element is not uh, moving at all so we have what the forces that are acting along x-axis we have the force this is the force because of the shear shear stress tau prime y x that will be tau prime that will be tau prime y x uh, multiplied by multiplied this is the shear stress multiplied by the area over which this is acting the, it, the area will be it is a top area this area which is equal uh, delta x multiplied by thickness so we'll write delta x into t okay this is t delta x then we have the shear stress is acting along plus x axis therefore we write this as plus and we have the shear stress because of the shear force because of the tau y so we write this as this is acting along minus y direction so we'll write this as minus tau y x and it's acting on the bottom face whose area is equal to delta x multiplied by t for equilibrium the summation of these two forces has to be equal to zero therefore if you look at here this tau prime yx minus tau yx and and multiplied by delta x into t i will write t is equal to zero okay so from this equation we can therefore from this equation we can obtain as tau prime from this equation we can simply obtain uh, since this volume element is very very small it collapses almost to a point that's possible when only this delta x is very very small and goes to zero therefore we can write tau prime y x has to be equal tau y x okay what does this condition tell us this says tau prime 
y x where is tau prime y x it is the shear stress here this shear stress tau prime y x the shear stress here is equal to tau y x that is the shear stress here okay so it means the shear stress is acting on the opposite uh, faces are equal okay tau y prime y x is equal to x y similarly let's see if we write the equilibrium equations along y axis summing up all the force along y axis and putting them equal to zero what we will obtain summing up all the forces along y axis and putting them equal to zero we can have the force because of this it will be tau prime x y the force because of the shear stress tau prime x y this is shear stress multiplied by the area over which it is acting it's acting delta y multiplied by t it's delta y into t it's acting upwards that's why we'll take it positive and we have this minus this is tau x y and delta y into t this is the shear force is equal to zero therefore this is a clear indication that again as you take this delta y out therefore we can write tau prime x y comes out equal to tau x y which is a clear so it means tau prime that is the shear force uh, shear stress on this plane is equal to the shear force on this very plane see the shear force here is the longitudinal shear stress this shear stress here is long so it means the two longitudinal stresses are equal and the two transverse stresses are also equal okay so the transfer stress here is equal to the transfer stress shear stress here and longitudinal shear stress here is equal to the longitudinal shear stress here okay uh, so this is quite an indication so we can simply if you have to write that's why whenever an, an element has been drawn out you will find that on this plane he has written tau and on the opposite plane he will also write tau if you write say for example tau prime on the top plane you have to write tau prime as the uh, shear stress on the bottom plane that is the shear stresses on the opposite sides are equal this is one condition another is let's write the or take this point a okay write down balance all the moments because for the equilibrium of this element it's not only the summation of forces has to be zero but the effect the, the turning effect of this uh, forces that is the moment the, the, the effect of these forces in terms of the moments should also be equal zero only then this equilibrium this element will be in equilibrium so what we do uh, let's write these equations here so we have obtained so let's uh, do one thing uh, let's erase this data and let's start now taking the moment equations let's balance this let's take this moments about any of the corner let's say for example take moments about let's say for example take moments about corner a now as we went on to take the moments about corner a we'll write summing up all the moments about corner a has to be equal to zero for equilibrium even for sum of moments about corner d should be zero sum of moments about corner c and corner d should also be equal to zero for the equilibrium of this uh, element okay let's for example take about uh, about corner a so once we start taking moments then we will be taking the moments because of the forces uh, on face bc and force dc because we know the moment because of the force on face ad and ba will be zero because they are you know intersecting with the point a so the moment because of this uh, because of this bc for force on the face bc will be equal first of all write down the force that will be tau prime yx this is the stress multiplied by area that is delta x into t that is t delta x delta x into t okay this is the force multiplied by the force arm the force arm is this much okay the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the, and the point at which you are actually calculating the moment we are calculating at point a the perpendicular distance is this much which is equal to delta y so we'll write this as delta y and what is this bc this force trying to do it is trying to if you look it is trying to rotate the entire system in the clockwise direction 
so let's we'll be representing the clockwise moments as negative okay now what about the moment because of this tau prime xy that will be since this is trying this force will try to rotate it in anti clockwise direction we'll call this as positive it will be tau prime xy multiplied by the area that is delta y into t multiplied by force arm Hum, the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the point a that's equal delta x so we'll multiply it with the delta x for equilibrium this has to be equal uh, zero okay so for equilibrium this has to be equal to zero uh, again just try to solve it so we'll write this as minus tau prime yx plus tau prime xy multiplied by this is delta x delta y t so we can write this as delta x delta y and your t is equal to zero so we know this entire volume element uh, we are doing this analysis not on a volume element actually we are doing it at a point so for that purpose this delta x should be go to zero delta y should be go, go to zero that also gives us an indication that therefore uh, uh, since therefore we can have tau prime therefore this term is also equal to zero which is tau prime y x has to be equal tau prime x y okay so look at this what we are getting we are getting tau prime y x that is this type tau prime y x is equal to tau prime x y that's equal to this oh this is quite interesting from equilibrium equations summation of the forces we got that this shear stress is equal to this shear stress okay and this shear stress is equal to this shear stress now we are getting that this shear stress is equal to this shear stress that means this shear stress is also equal to this shear stress okay and since this shear stress is equal to this it means that all the shear stresses are equal that is this shear stress if you represent represent with tau this shear stress has to be equal to tau this shear stress has to be equal to tau this shear stress has to be equal to tau it means that the shear stresses as far as the concept of this shear stresses is concerned that the shear stresses on the uh, adjacent sides are equal the shear stresses on the opposite sides of an element are also equal this is what is called the complementary property of the shear okay and we know that as far as this shear is concerned we have been calling this shear as transverse shear so it means in case of members like beams as uh, as far as the transverse shear is concerned the transverse shear is nothing it's as same as the longitudinal stresses though their uh, you know existence is different the longitudinal stress is acting in some other uh, direction and the shear stress is acting in some other direction sorry this uh, transverse shear stress is acting uh, here the longitudinal shear stress is the long shear stresses here the transverse shear stresses shear stresses here but their magnitudes are same okay since while we have uh, derived these equalities the signs on both sides have been positive so you have plus sign here plus sign here it means this is the actual arrangement in which the shear stresses are acting actually on a plane at some, oh, oh, sorry actually acting on a volume element that is at some corner both the indices will be meeting at some corner the both the two uh, you know tails will be uh, receding away from each other okay here at corner b you have tails going away from each other at corner a and at corner d and corner c you see the the, the, the heads are meeting heads of these vectors are meeting but at the corner b and the corner d the tails are you know receding away from each other so this is how actually the shear stress uh, is it gets distributed over a volume element and this property that we have just derived this is what we call as a complementary property of the shear stress okay the complementary property of shear stress we have here derived for the stresses or the forces acting along x and y direction only the same is true for shear stresses acting along the z direction okay so uh, as far as uh, 
uh, this uh, concept is concerned, what we could obtain from here is as far as the beams are concerned, in the beams we do have the transverse shear stresses, the longitudinal shear stresses, and from the complementary property of shear stresses, the longitudinal and the, uh, the, the uh, transverse shear stresses are equal. Okay, so this is a uh, very important, uh, you know, uh, what we call as uh, the understanding of the concepts. I would uh, recommend my students to go through the theory which is given here as uh, these diagrams are clearly indicating that before de deformation as grid lines have been drawn on these uh, beams and it has been subjected to shear force V. And this is showing what happens to the beam after deformation that a portion goes inwards, a portion moves outwards, which we'll be discussing in the coming lectures. So now after understanding the concept of this uh, shear stress longitudinal and transverse shear, hopefully we'll be taking the concept of the shear formula, hopefully in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much.